everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for the eighth annual meeting of the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum, hosted by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, and the New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization. Now let us begin this side event, the Roadmap Event, Carbon Mineralization. First of all, I would like to introduce the moderator for this session, Mr. David Sandalo. Mr. David Sandalo is an Innovation for Cool Earth Forum Steering Committee member. The inaugural fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University and co-director of Energy and Environment Concentration at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. The speakers for this session are Dr. S. Julio Friedman, Senior Research Scholar, Center for Global Energy Policy, Columbia University. Dr. Roger Ains, Chief Scientist, Energy Program, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Professor Peter Kelman, Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences, Columbia University. Ms. Brianna Schumit, Staff Scientist, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Dr. Colin McCormick, Adjunct Associate Professor, the Walsh School of Foreign Service, Georgetown University. Dr. E.M. M. Power, Assistant Professor, Department of Environmental and Life Sciences, Trent University. Dr. Sasha Wilson, Associate Professor, Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, University of Alberta. Now I would like to ask Mr. David Sandalo to moderate this session. So Mr. Sandalo, if you please. Thank you very much and good morning in Tokyo. What a tremendous day of dialogue yesterday with tremendous discussions among some of the world's leading experts on clean energy and climate change. And we're excited to kick off today's sessions with the discussion of this year's ICEF Innovation Roadmap on the topic of carbon mineralization. Good evening from New York City, where I'm located. Um, and before we get started with the discussion of the roadmap, which is the main topic uh, of our discussion of our hour here, we're going to do a, a book launch. Um, we have a book called Energizing America, which um, which we are releasing in Japanese language uh, for the first time. Um, and I I'm a co-author of that book, along with um, Dr. Julio Friedman, who's going to tell us a little bit right now about Energizing America um, and uh, its basic themes. Um, and then I can say how we can you can find it um, in its Japanese language edition. Dr. Friedman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, David. Konnichiwa. Uh, thank you to the audience for being here and attending. And thank you, of course, to the Innovation for a Cool Earth Forum for having us. May I have the first slide, please, which shows the new report that we wrote last year, Energizing America, which was focused on how do we stimulate and supercharge innovation through U.S. investment from the government. This is a topic, of course, which METI is very familiar with and the Japanese government has done for many years. Next slide. In that exact context, they requested that we translate energizing America into Japanese so that more people could become familiar with the ideas inside, specifically about what is important around achieving an energy transition and the kind of role that innovation can play. Next slide. Importantly, there's a handful of topics which come forward which are important to understand. Uh, one of those, for example, is really advanced technology systems, which do not yet have commercial scale, uh, such as hydrogen, uh, whether it is clean hydrogen in blue form or in green form, but also novel climate technologies like direct air capture. We realized that we needed to accelerate decarbonization through clean energy innovation, because according to the International Energy Agency, 40 out of 46 energy technologies that we will need to achieve 
a stable climate at two degrees Celsius are not on track and are not deployed. And in fact, half of the reductions that we will need come from technologies that have not yet reached markets. Some of them are in early technology stages. Some of them are in pre-commercial testing, but either way, there's a role for innovation to bring these to market. Next slide, please. Energizing America comes in two parts. The first part is to make the case for a mission, a new mission in national energy innovation. And as part of that mission, we must triple the federal funding for clean energy. That funding will come in many different forms and importantly, in many different parts of the government. We proposed to do that very quickly, tripling the US investment in clean energy innovation uh, from $8 billion to $25 billion in five short years. And that that was federal investments in clean energy innovation necessary to achieve improvements in climate uh, stability and change. Next slide, please. Part two is a description of what exactly that means, where the money should go, what should we invest in. Specifically, we recommended 10 different technology arenas and pillars, six strategic principles, and three immediate actions that the US government could take to supercharge and stimulate clean tech innovation across the board. I encourage you to go into the new report in Japanese and see what we mean in these different areas. I will spend a little bit of time explaining why we think this investment is needed and what those 10 pillars are. It's important to note that the strategic principles are ones that will be somewhat new to the federal government, chiefly diversifying. Diversifying funding across different groups and agencies, diversifying across a portfolio of options, and also creating long-lived stable funding platforms so that scientists and companies can anticipate continued support for the innovation. Next slide, please. We noted the fact that there is a lot of money coming back into clean tech innovation. However, it is much less than we need. Uh, although the funding has grown over the past couple of years again, mostly that is limited to a small number of arenas and it is a lot of early stage investment. However, when you compare the total amount of money going into key sectors in the US economy, energy receives by far the smallest share. The United States government commits basically eight times more money just to innovation in automobiles, uh, almost 10 times the money going into aerospace. Uh, pharmaceuticals receive an enormous amount of money. All of that makes sense, but given the urgency of climate and clean energy, we thought it was important to add to the energy pool and that that would have a salutary positive effect of bringing in private investment in innovation. Next slide. I'm going to end here with a brief discussion of the technology pillars, where we wanted to focus the arena. And specifically, we wanted to look instead of at fuel types, which is how the government is currently organized, instead of thinking about energy and climate services and where are areas that are underserved. So for example, we have one pillar, which is foundational science, which would cover all the arenas, early stage research, but then we say clean energy generation. And there are many ways to do clean energy generation, wind, solar, geothermal, etc. Next slide. After that, we talk about fuels and transportation systems, which would include biofuels and hydrogen, as well as synthetic fuels and you're creating a modern power grid that can be used to fuel vehicles as well as other systems, making it reliable and flexible. Next slide. As its own topic, we focus on buildings. And clean and efficient buildings themselves bring a lot of different technologies and integrated assessments together, ranging from something like heat pumps to heating and cooling systems to lighting to air flows to insulation. The last four technology pillars we identify are cross-cutting needs and ones that have generally received under investment over the years. Industrial decarbonization, carbon capture and use, clean agricultural systems, 
meaning adding food and agricultural systems to an energy economy. And last, carbon dioxide removal as a supplement to all of the other clean energy technologies. In point of fact, all four of those topics are relatively new and underrepresented, and we advise the U.S. government specifically to increase the fraction of investment in those areas much higher than the other ones. Clean energy and fuels have received a substantial amount of funding over the years, and they need more. Here we are suggesting we, we create a much larger increase in all of these four categories. Last slide. Of course, you can read all about this. Next slide, I'm sorry, after that. One more slide, please. Anyways, I am confident that you will be able to read all about these things in the Japanese edition, and we look forward to talking to you about it in a future ICEF meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julio. And we commend, if anyone is interested in this topic of clean energy innovation, you can find this on the website of the Center for Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Um, these slides will be posted on the ICEF website. Um, and please download the Japanese language version, and we're delighted to follow up with anyone who might be interested. And, and now I'm delighted to turn to the main topic of, of this session, which is the ninth ICEF Innovation Roadmap. And if you could please bring up the slide deck. Uh, and here you see our co-authors. We really have an extraordinary group of co-authors that came together to produce this roadmap. Uh, and you're going to hear from them tonight. Uh, next slide. As I said, this is the ninth ICEF Innovation Roadmap. Um, you see them listed here. Um, last year, we produced one on biomass carbon removal and storage, bikers. Uh, we've done a number of other topics, and they're all on the ICEF website. And if you're interested, please go take a look. Next slide. And with this, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Brianna Schmidt. Thank you, David. Uh, so as David mentioned, the, the topic of this year's roadmap is carbon mineralization. Uh, so what is carbon mineralization? Uh, very simply, it's a process by which CO2 becomes bound in rocks uh, as a solid mineral. So this is a process that happens um, naturally at a slow rate um, for certain rocks, um, particularly rocks that are rich in calcium and magnesium. They are exposed to and react with carbon dioxide, and then that reaction forms solid, stable carbonate minerals. Um, this natural process removes um, somewhere around 0.3 gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere each year. Next slide. So rocks are one of Earth's largest carbon reservoirs, um, and rocks incorporate uh, carbon in part through a process known as chemical weathering. Uh, so through that process, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere dissolves into rain and surface water. Um, that dissolved CO2 then forms a weak acid called carbonic acid. Um, that acid then dissolves minerals in rocks and it releases ions um, such as calcium and magnesium and sodium. Um, some of these ions can react locally with the dissolved CO2 to form carbonate minerals. Um, others are then carried by rivers to the ocean where they precipitate in carbonate minerals such as calcite and dolomite. Um, and they eventually then accumulate on the ocean floor to form sedimentary rocks such as limestone and evaporites. Um, those are eventually um, carried uh, through subduction zones um, into the Earth's mantle, where reactions then uh, release the CO2 again, um, which is released into the atmosphere through volcanoes. So that's the natural process of chemical weathering, and it's part of what we call the slow carbon cycle. Uh, next slide, please. So the um, engineered practice of carbon mineralization um, seeks to speed up this natural process of chemical weathering to help fight climate change. Um, we, our analysis, um, we believe that carbon mineralization could help remove many gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere each year. And there are two broad approaches by which this could happen. Uh, the first is uh, by injecting CO2 rich fluids 
into rock formations deep underground, um, which we refer to as in situ mineralization. Um, after the CO2 is injected, it reacts with those rocks underground to form those solid stable carbon minerals, uh, carbonate minerals, excuse me. Um, the other sort of broad approach is exposing crushed rocks at the Earth's surface to CO2 bearing gases, and this referred to as either ex situ or surficial mineralization. Uh, next slide, please. So the amount of rock that is suitable for carbon mineralization is vast. Um, as you can see on this map, um, they're generally referred to in two different um, sort of geologic terms. They're known as mafic and ultramafic rocks. Um, you can see on this map that they're located all around the world. Um, there are hundreds of trillions of tons of these rocks uh, within a few kilometers of the Earth's surface that can be used for carbon mineralization. And so the potential for carbon mineralization to remove CO2 from the atmosphere is vast. Uh, it's you know many times greater than all of the CO2 that's ever been emitted by all human activities. Uh, so the potential is enormous. Um, and uh, we think this uh, has great potential and, uh, and uh, deserves additional attention. Um, with that, I will turn it back to David. Th uh, thanks, Dr. Schmidt. And now I'm delighted to turn the floor over to Professor Peter Kellerman of Columbia University. He's one of the leading experts in the world on these topics. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting from slide seven, great, okay. So uh, as Dr. Schmidt said, uh, we can do uh, injection of CO2 bearing fluids into the subsurface, and we can do that for both uh, storage of CO2 that's been captured elsewhere or for uh, direct removal of CO2 from surface waters, uh, carbon depleted waters to the surface where they will draw down CO2 directly from the air. So in the schematic diagram on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see some example end member processes. The blue ones refer to use of CO2 captured and purified elsewhere. You can compress that CO2 into supercritical uh, fluid that's almost as dense as water, or you can inject the CO2 into dense water in the sub in subsurface where it dissolves. Either way, you use purified CO2 to form carbonate minerals. They're inert, they're non-toxic, and it's essentially permanent storage requiring very little monitoring and verification. On the right, you're looking at the possibility, as I mentioned, of direct removal of CO2 from the air. You take fluids that are equilibrated with the atmosphere that have many times about 100 parts per million dissolved carbon dioxide, circulate them through rocks in the subsurface, return carbon depleted water to the surface and draw down carbon dioxide directly from the air. In the middle, there's an enormous opportunity for exploration of processes that combine elements of both of these two methods. So I won't go into this in detail, but it can be quite a bit less expensive to enrich air uh, via direct air capture methods to 10 or 20% carbon dioxide instead of 100% carbon dioxide. And you can then count on the mineralization process to complete that separation and capture. Next slide, please. Turning from those underground methods to surficial methods, one can use crushed rock or indeed some kinds of industrial waste that is also rich in calcium and magnesium to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Some materials that we can extract from rocks are extremely reactive. And so, for example, calcium oxide and magnesium oxide can become about 75% uh, uh, carbonated in the course of a few weeks. And so uh, this process can be rapid and then uh, on the other hand, uh, it may require quite a bit of land area. And so, and one can ask uh, if the amount of um, waste material and mine tailings we produce every year is sufficient to uh, have a significant impact. And that in turn raises the question of whether one might mine rocks for the purpose of CO2 removal from air. Okay, so looking at slide nine, next slide, please. We can imagine that we would use mine wastes from rocks that are rich in magnesium and calcium for the purpose of 
CO2 storage. Uh, for the most part, this is not going to be a CO2 removal from air method, but it is a very effective way of taking relatively enriched CO2 gas and reacting it with rocks for permanent storage. There are also industrial wastes, billions of tons of industrial waste, legacy wastes that are rich in magnesium and calcium that are ready for storage use. And again, as I mentioned, one could uh, consider mining rock for the purpose of CO2 removal from air and optimizing the reactivity of that material. The largest potential for industrial waste uh, globally, uh, looking at it nation by nation, is in China, followed by India. David, I'm trying to remember when I'm supposed to turn this over to Alan. It, it, uh, let's do the next slide. Okay, Please. thank you. Yep. All right, and so uh, not only can carbon dioxide mineralization processes of uh, industrial wastes and mine tailings uh, store CO2, they can also help to remediate environmental risks. And so, for example, when we mine ultramafic rocks, very often they contain asbestos and the carbon mineralization process will asbestos into harmless magnesium carbonate minerals. And so with that, I'll turn and this I, I, uh, presentation I, back over to Professor Sandalow. Great, so next slide, please. Um, uh, another way that, uh, that we can use uh, carbon mineralization to uh, remove and sequester carbon dioxide is in cement and concrete processes. And we talk about that in the chapter in, in the roadmap, and we'll come back to that in the discussion session. Uh, next slide, please. Now I'm delighted to turn this over to Dr. Roger Raines of Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, also one of the leading experts in the world on these topics. Thank you very much, David. Can I have the next slide, please? Our first high-level finding is that the potential for permanently storing carbon dioxide in carbon that's mineralized is large. It, there are references in the literature of up to 10 billion tons. We looked at that specifically and said, with a time frame, we think that we could do a billion tons of CO2 by year 2035 and up to 10 gigatons by year 2050. Next slide, please. Carbon mineralization has a number of very positive attributes. The rocks that you need to do it or mineral waste are widely distributed around the world and especially the rocks are nearly unlimited. So you can choose the best places in which to do this. The form that is the CO2 is turns into when it is mineralized is solid and permanent. And so you don't have the problems of escape that you might have with a liquid or a gas. Most importantly, the rocks already contain the energy that is needed to conduct the process. So you do not need to add energy to this. So it's very different than almost every other carbon capture scheme, which are very energy intensive. And the costs appear to be reasonable, although that is one of the big things that has to be determined. Next slide. There are, of course, challenges associated with something that we think is such a large capacity, but is today being done on a very small level. First is that natural processes that do this are very slow. We need to figure out how to speed them up. We don't know where the best resources are. Just because rocks are all over the world doesn't mean that those are the rocks that you would choose to use. And so those need to be mapped and determined. We like to think that when we do a process like this, we might be able to sell the products. It's, it's likely that the products, the carbonates, the magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonates are going to have relatively low value. And so that won't be a big part of offsetting the cost. And today, perhaps the biggest problem is that carbon mineralization receives no government support and, or recognition in climate policies. There's only one nation who uh, have included that in their Paris obligation. Next slide, please. 
one of the most important things that we need at this point is demonstrations. We need to go out in the field, into the mountains, into the, the sources of these uh, industrial waste. We need to try these things out at large scale, thousands of tons of material. This is, there's been a lot of laboratory experiments. We're convinced that it will work, but we need to get out in the field and try the, discover the real world experience that is necessary to understand what it takes to get to a billion tons. Next. A question that gets asked commonly is to compare carbon mineralization with direct air capture. Why is that question asked? Well, both of them are, are things that people will tell you are essentially unlimited. We could do as much of them as we want to. There are also things that are new and that are essentially untested at scale. And so it's interesting. Well, they're gigantic. We don't know how well they work. What's the comparison between them? Well, we found that both of these are early stage and expensive today. So those steps, those prices need to come down. The pathway to drive those costs down is relatively clear. And you saw our roadmap a couple of years ago on director capture. And this year, the roadmap describes those paths for carbon mineralization. They can be done all over the world and they have great promise. Specifically, compared to direct air capture, carbon mineralization, the biggest difference is that it doesn't require as much energy. Direct air capture requires a lot of energy. And direct air and carbon mineralization may have a other benefits such as improving soil improvements, uh, soil fertility. Fundamentally, carbon mineralization is harder to monitor than direct air capture, where all you have to do is put a meter on the CO2 going underground, whereas the monitoring of large areas or large amounts of rock can be slightly different. With that, I'll turn it back to David. Thank you very much, Roger. So we make four recommendations uh, in this roadmap. Uh, next slide, please. And the first recommendation is that governments and companies should invest in research and development on carbon mineralization. And in particular, we recommend launching dozens of new pilot projects and demonstration projects uh, in different geographies around the world. That's what it's going to take to determine a number of different items that really re require to be need to be addressed uh, as part of any scale up carbon mineralization to address climate change. Next slide, please. There, there is an interesting example of just such a project which uh, NATO uh, is funding right now, and it's a project uh, in on calcium carbonate circulation system for construction. Um, and uh, it's exactly the type of project that we recommend be replicated, you know, in, in dozens of different situations with lots of different variations around the world. Next slide, please. Our next recommendation is that policymakers should add carbon mineralization to their portfolio of climate change mitigation options. Um, there's lots of things that can be done here, um, providing um, recognition and emissions trading programs, providing tax incentives and more. And at present, there are almost no governments in the world that do that. Um, regulatory systems uh, need to be reviewed to assess their um, uh, approach to carbon mineralization. Um, in many cases, regulations might hamper the development of projects in this area, um, when in fact there could be great benefits in, in streamlining regulations and enhancing them. And so we recommend that. And, and, and then this is an area that could create jobs in numbers of communities um, that have been stressed in different places around the world, in particular mining communities. And we recommend uh, much more thorough research into the job creating potential of carbon mineralization. Next slide, please. Our third and fourth recommendations focus on companies, and we think there's enormous opportunities for corporate leadership in this area. Uh, mining companies in particular, kind of the obvious ones, as well as some manufacturers of iron and steel and uh, chemicals and cement, um, they have opportunities to um, use carbon mineralization processes to become carbon neutral, or even carbon negative in their operations. And we recommend that they uh, look at this seriously and implement programs in this area in the years ahead. Next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, any company with a zero emissions commitment um, should be paying attention to carbon mineralization. All, all companies with zero emissions commitments should start by 
reducing emissions to the extent possible from their own operations. But then to the extent that companies are looking for offsets, this is an area that offers tremendous potential that really hasn't received the attention that it deserves in our view. Next slide. Uh, so we, we provide in, in our document um, a roadmap, a visual roadmap. You can see here, I won't go through every detail, but a section on policy and standards. Next slide. A section, a section on R&D. Next slide. And a section on corporate leadership. Next slide, please. And then next slide. Next slide. So in conclusion, just to kind of sum it all up, carbon mineralization is a process in which CO2 becomes bound in rocks as a solid mineral. Um, it can help remove gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere each year. Um, we think with, uh, with sound and uh, strong and sustained policies, the carbon mineralization processes could reduce or remove one gigaton of CO2 from the atmosphere by 2035 and 10 gigatons by 2050. That could make a meaningful difference in achieving net zero emissions. The next step is launching dozens of pilots worldwide, and we think policy and corporate leadership is essential. Now, if you have any questions, please um, uh, submit them in the chat. We'd love to, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And, uh, and with that, you can find our roadmap on the ICEF website. And now, if you could pull down the slides and bring up all of our co-authors. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm really delighted to, to see all these co-authors. It's a great team that's been working on this. And I want to um, bring into the conversation a couple of our co-authors who haven't spoken yet, starting with Colin McCormick of Georgetown University. Um, and uh, Colin, could you talk about opportunities here in the con in the cement and concrete industry, which is such a big emitter of uh, greenhouse gases globally? Can carbon mineralization help to control emissions from from that industry? Well, it certainly can. Thank you, David. I think it's very important to look at that sector. Cement and concrete is a sector with a high potential for adopting carbon mineralization processes. Uh, that's very important because of how big that sector is. It produces um, globally billions of tons of cement and tens of billions of tons of concrete uh, every year. So this is absolutely enormous. There are three basic pathways that cement and concrete can use mineralization. Two of those have to do with uh, the, um, the early phase uh, or the phase of curing car uh, concrete and mixing concrete. So this is when you're producing either precast concrete or ready mix concrete. Both of those can use pure CO2 and under some conditions that can lead to strengthened and improved uh, concrete performance while, while locking away CO2 in a mineralized solid form within that concrete. Uh, the third area is uh, known as synthetic aggregates. Uh, we can use carbon mineralization to produce solid rocks that can then go into concrete and substitute for the coarse and fine sand and gravel that's, uh, that's normally used. One example of that also is um, carbonating, mineralizing recycled concrete, as we saw with the, the, the NEATO project we highlighted earlier. That can help strengthen uh, recycled concrete and allow it to be, to be beneficially reused, saving emissions in the process. Anyone else want to weigh in on cement and concrete? Let, let me bring in uh, Professor Wilson from the University of Alberta, um, who is a leading expert on, on the mining industry and, and related issues. And um, what, what's the potential here, Sasha, for mine waste? Um, I mean, can, can, could mine waste really make a material difference um, by using carbon mineralization when it comes to fighting climate change? Stay with the dot. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, like the cement and concrete industry, mining is one of the world's largest industries uh, and collectively the world's mines extract and process about 100 billion tons of rock a year. And about 5% of that rock that's moved by the global mining industry is suitable for mineralizing 
carbon dioxide. So that's about uh, 400 million tons of rock that's crushed each year that is reactive with carbon dioxide and can be used to trap and store the, that greenhouse gas. So the global potential of mining to sequester carbon dioxide and minerals is a little under 200 million tons of CO2 per year today. One interesting thing about the global mining industry and these reactive rocks is that many of the critical metals that we need to build renewable energy infrastructure come from ultramafic and mafic rocks. So the reactive rocks that are good for carbon mineralization come from mines for platinum, for nickel and cobalt, which are used for batteries, and other critical metals. So there are estimates that the global mining industry needs to expand mining of these metals by at least two times in order to build the renewable energy infrastructure we need. So the amount of carbon mineralization that we could get each year might reach um, over 300 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. Uh, finally, uh, we already have billions, tens of billions of tons at least of this finely pulverized reactive rock that's built up from hundreds of years of large scale mining. And so we already have these materials present at vast quantities at our surface um, to kickstart that carbon mineralization process. You know, re related to that, Professor Kellerman mentioned that you could imagine a world in which ro rock is being mined for the purpose of carbon mineralization. Um, I wondered if you or any of the other panelists have any thoughts on that. How feasible is that? Or, or we, that would certainly be, you know, something new. We haven't seen that. Um, uh, rock actually being mined in order to help fight climate change. Um, could you could you talk about that? I'm glad to to start on that and turn it over to uh, Dr. Kellerman. Uh, we already have very good estimates of where critical metal resources like nickel are and how much rock contains that metal. And so the U.S. government has estimates that indicate that at least 60 billion tons of ultramafic rock that contain nickel that is useful as a resource could feasibly be mined today. Hmm. Peter, what, when do you think we're going to see this happen? Yeah, I'll, sure, I'll c carry that on in, in two, two ways. One, which I, I should have emphasized more earlier, is there's a proposal that we, we should simply take um, ultramafic and mafic rocks without extracting anything quarry them, grind them, and spread them on agricultural soil. And um, this is a potentially very uh, effective way to remove carbon dioxide directly from air. And it may, as we mentioned, uh, also provide some uh, benefit in terms of increasing the fertility of some soils. So that's something that's being actively investigated at a basic research level particularly by a group in the UK led by David Beerling. Uh, the second idea is that uh, one can actually improve the extraction potential of rocks uh, for ore. So, in, for example, in particular nickel, uh, much of the nickel in ultramafic rocks is bound in silicate minerals that are kind of hard to chemically break down. But if one were to carbonate those rocks, the nickel would make its way into minerals that are significantly easier, uh, from which it is significantly easier to remove the nickel. The third thing is, yes, one could mine rock for the purpose of carbon dioxide removal from air, and indeed, in do so doing, choose the rocks that are the most reactive for that specific purpose. And I mentioned that briefly, but um, this has the potential to be as inexpensive or possibly more inexpensive than other proposed methods for direct removal of CO2 from the air. Mm -hmm. I, I wanna bring in uh, Professor Ian Power of Trent University, who uh, uh, particularly on the topic that Peter was first talking about, about um, application of crushed rock to, in, in fields. Um, 
And I know you've you've done some work in that area. Any, any thoughts, Ian, about kind of soil fertility and, and co-benefits um, in that area? Sure. Um, just to add to, to Peter's comment just quickly, um, I think it, it also very much depends on the carbon price. And you know, if we can demonstrate that uh, a mining company can mine a ton of rock and that ton of rock has a value uh, for CO2 sequestration, if it's economical, then you know, mining companies may pursue that. Um, my understanding that mining costs of rock are approximately ten dollars per ton, so it's it's not a high cost to to extract and grind and, and crush rock. Um, the other thing, sort of in between those two end members, you know, you, there are a number of ore deposits that are low grade, um, which may not currently be economical based on metal prices, for example. But if you layer in a price on carbon. Um, some low grade or low grade deposits could become economical. So those are some things to consider. Um, sorry, to your question, David, which is a good one. Um, the concept of enhanced rock weathering of taking rock powder and, and spreading it in uh, different lands, including agricultural lands, uh, a major co-benefit of that is that the rocks that we're talking about not only contain calcium and magnesium, but also contain macro and micronutrients such as potassium and phosphorus, uh, which can enhance soil fertility. And, and that can be a major driver. Um, um, colleagues of mine that have done research in this, this field at the University of Guelph, um, they've told me directly that you know, farmers, you know, they, they of course care about crop yields and that's their main motivation. And, and so we can demonstrate that um, spreading of rock powder will improve their, their yields then ends up being a sort of win-win situation. We have a question from the audience. Um, uh, question, could you please share with us some methodologies which are currently in R&D phase, but could be utilized for monitoring and measuring the CO2 removal uh, in the future? Um, I don't know, Julio or Roger, any, any thoughts on, on that topic? Uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Okay, yeah. We could talk about carb fix potentially. Yep. I, I can see why um, there was some silence there because there's such a broad spectrum of uh, options for carbon mineralization. Some uh, very challenging and interesting to monitor and verify, and some relatively simple um, and uh, obvious. So let's start with the simple and the obvious. Um, if one forms carbonate minerals, um, either on the surface or in the subsurface, one can directly observe that by sampling the minerals and measuring the carbon content of the rocks that have been affected, and also by measuring the carbon content of water coming out the other end. So, for example, at the CarbFix experiment in Iceland, they demonstrated that's 95% of the carbon in the injected water uh, was lost to mineralization along a flow path through the rocks in the subsurface, and only 5% came out the other end. So that's pretty straightforward. And uh, methods for direct air capture of CO2 that produce a pure stream of carbon dioxide at the back end, of course, it's, it's relatively straightforward to measure the amount of CO2 that's produced. And therefore, it's pretty easy to persuade people that you know, you've captured a certain number of tons of CO2 and you'd like to be paid for that. On the other end of the spectrum, it's a very interesting research challenge to try to measure carbon uptake where we distribute rock powder very uh, diffusely, uh, just a few uh, uh, kilograms per square meter over thousands or millions of square meters, um, this becomes a very interesting challenge to detect small changes per square meter over enormous areas. And I think it's a really good opportunity for those of you who are in the research community to develop a statistically robust method that would allow us to evaluate the effect of that and ultimately to do the accounting that would allow people to be paid for that. David, I can't hear you. 
Thank you. I, I muted myself because an ambulance or a siren came by here on the streets of New York, and then I forgot about that. Um, uh, as as uh, Peter is a non-scientist thinking about that topic you were just discussing, um, I, I wonder if if one knows the the weight of the rocks that are distributed over a field and knows it's you know rough calcium or magnesium content, and the rates at which it reacts. Would that form a basis for reasonably reliable measurement or or not, or not necessarily? As a scientist, I would be inclined to believe that. Okay. If I were paying for it, I might be inclined to ask for more verification. I see. Okay. Um, you know, one um, one question of, of great interest, I'm sure, to some people in the, you know in the audience in Japan is what the opportunities are in Japan in this area, and what um, what uh, the right what minerals are in Japan that might be relevant here? If anyone has any any thoughts on that, um, I think that that'd be very interesting to hear. Um, Roger, leaders at Waseda University have recently published a study in which they looked at these kinds of rocks all up and down Japan, and found that there was a very large capacity in Japan for conducting this kind of work, and that there were a very large number of locations in which it could be done. And so Japan is one of the very ripe places around the world for carbon mineralization. The rocks are here, they're good, there's a lot of them. And just kind of a, a, elaborating on that is, you know, what, what types of projects, is, you know, anyone have any thoughts of, you know, if, if uh, you're recommending to Medi um, what types of projects they might be looking at. Um, we've just talked about a, a variety of different about our underground in injection or other things, or, you know, what type of projects would make the most sense? All of them. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I would, in my own uh, sensibility here, I would recommend prioritizing these field projects. Um, this is really where we need to do learning and for specifically if we want to develop a regulation framework or a monitoring protocol or a market that values these things, the field project is actually where this comes together. I would add that the field project should be augmented by laboratory studies. Many of the kind of kinetic information you would want to know, uh, some of the specificity of the specific minerals in each of these deposits and the characterization uh, would need to take place in a laboratory. And there's a good basis to do mo laboratory work. Uh, there's also good work for federal and government analysis. Uh, these rock bodies exist in Japan. Excellent. How about doing real detailed characterization of those sites so that we understand what the resource really is? And based on the resource, how you could translate that resource into a reserve that the Japanese government could think about as part of its carbon planning. Uh, but really, really, all of things will be augmented and really determined by the field programs. And so that's where there's the most greatest urgency. And Dr. Ains had pointed that out as part of the research agenda. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in for a second here. So, um, for those of you, the, our listeners who are not familiar with it, the carb fix experiment in Iceland uh, involved injection of water enriched in CO2 into basaltic lavas. Of course, there are many volcanoes in Iceland as there are in Japan. And the method that they used there is unusual in the literature on carbon dioxide storage because they do not need an impermeable cap rock to keep the carbon dioxide underground. Because they introduce it into the subsurface dissolved in water, there's basically no risk of leakage even before it's mineralized. So that procedure could be exported almost without modification to mm. many, many areas in Japan. And I'll also add that young lavas with lots of glass in them, and some of you will be familiar with what I mean, are ideal for this purpose. And Peter, obviously seismic risks are at the top of the mind in Japan. That Would this create seismic risks in your view? Well, 
certainly not in unconsolidated lavas. Um, the deeper you go, the higher the risk. But the natural process is creating magnitude minus two events that we are able to measure, but that aren't detectable by any human ear or foot. So I wouldn't expect there to be a significant seismic risk, even for the deeper methods of subsurface carbon mineralization. We're trying, trying desperately to hear these things as magnitude minus two and minus three events. Mm -hmm. So many of people in Japan will be familiar with the Richter magnitude scale. Those are 11 orders of magnitude, which is a uh, hundred billion times smaller than a big earthquake. Uh, let me add that Japan has already done multiple experiments injecting CO2 in pure form, and that has not caused earthquakes. Um, and, and there's multiple projects in Japan that validate that. There's a little bit of information you'd want to have up front, but again, planning a good field project, absolutely something to be sorted, not really a risk. We have a question from the audience about life cycle assessments um, and saying in particular, do you have any idea what, uh, what the life cycle assessment on, on all of these ideas and what should the accounting boundaries be? So he says, um, Anybody want to talk about life cycle assessments here and energy use that might be consumed in this process? I nominate Roger. Okay. Most I was of going to energy... nominate Colin, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do Roger and then Colin. <laughs> Most of the energy that you use in this process is in chemical form and it's already in the rocks. The rocks will spontaneously react with CO2. And so you don't need to add much. There is some, you need to grind the rocks. It turns out industrial processes have gotten very, very good at grinding rocks. And that's not a big energy expenditure. Mm -hmm. If you want to react them on something like uh, putting them on agricultural land, then you have a transportation cost and that can be significant. So one of the important elements in mapping this resource is to know where the rocks are that are close to the agricultural fields that you would like to put the rocks on. Colin? I certainly think that that's all correct. I'll, I'll uh, add some more color when it comes to the industrial wastes uh, end of things, uh, which I think, by the way, is another opportunity for Japan, uh, particularly uh, iron and steel slag can be used as a feedstock. And while Japan has a very high reuse and reutilization uh, rate of of that waste slag, there is there is still a substantial amount left that could be used for uh, mineralization experiments. In in those cases, however, um, grinding can still be an energy uh, a, a, an energy need to get that slag into a small enough form to have sufficient surface area for uh, carbonation to occur. So so you do need to think carefully about how you're doing that and what energy might go into that. One of the interesting areas uh, that's emerging now is modifying the industrial processes and the way that slag is cooled uh, in order to make it more amenable, more suitable for later mineralization. So thinking a little bit upstream when that slag waste is produced can improve that life cycle balance downstream when it's eventually used for a, as a mineralization feedstock. We have another question from the audience about the oceans and whether we should be considering reaction in the oceans uh, for carbon mineralization. Um, we do not address that in this roadmap, but would anybody like to to discuss it and offer some general thoughts? Colin, you want you want to take that and then uh, sure. I'm ha I'm happy to uh, mineralization. Uh, there are a, a number of proposals for mineralization in the oceans. Uh, in fact, a number of the ideas we've talked about today, surficial spreading. Uh, on, on agricultural soil, in fact, do result in carbon entering into a dissolved form in runoff water and making, making its way into the oceans. So in a sense, we're already uh, involving the oceans in some of these land-based uh, mineralization approaches. Um, there, there are alternative proposals to put uh, these reactive alkaline materials directly into the ocean. Sometimes those are called ocean liming or ocean alkalinity modification. Uh, and those do have a lot of potential. The, there, the monitoring and verification is even harder uh, 
than it is on land. Uh, and in many ways, it's even more critical to understand the potential ecological impacts uh, of putting that material into the ocean. So there's, there's a lot of potential, but there's a lot of questions that need to be answered there before going to scale. Uh, probably more, more substantial science that needs to be done there uh, as, as uh, compared to many of the topics we've discussed already today. And th this is this is a bit off topic from our roadmap, which doesn't cover this, but just, you know, again, as a non-scientist, it seems to me if you're putting alkalinity and volume in the ocean, you're probably neutralizing the acidification that happens from carbon dioxide. Is, is that a potential co-benefit here? Oh, absolutely. That's a huge potential co-benefit. So applying that alkalinity around uh, coral reefs uh, or other sensitive ecosystems, if it's done right uh, and carefully monitored, can, can buffer against that that uh, acidification. And so you do get a, a, a really good ancillary benefit. But I want to caution that much of that is still in the research stage. It does need it does need pilots, uh, but we need to be thoughtful about the ecological impacts of that. We're down to our last few minutes and I, we've, we haven't talked much about policy and I thought maybe we just, you know, close with a word or two on policy. I know Julio, you've, you've thought quite a bit about this and um, I wondered if you have any thoughts about Beyond, beyond pilot projects, what are the types of policies that you think governments around the world might be considering in this area? I may to the headline that you started with, and which is that this is not on anybody's menu. There is effectively zero policy around the world on this topic. It's not even clocked. As one example, in the United States, we have a carbon capture and storage tax credit, 45Q. Direct air capture is eligible. Carbon mineralization is not. There's barely a CO2 mineralization research program at the Department of Energy. It is not considered a creditable resource in most carbon markets. We're going to start with the, the most important policy change that is necessary is to recognize that there should be a policy and then take it from there. Uh, we're really, you know, and the fact is we know a lot more than people think we do. Yes, there's questions we want answered. Yes, there's innovation to happen. Yes, there's research to be done. But we know enough to say this is important to do. And uh, we need to start these processes to get to a point where we can get international governance and rules around such things. But today, the most important policy decision to make, start. Include this in your planning consider it as important an option as any other option, especially in a nation like Japan, which has such exceptionally good mineralization resource. Same thing for the United States, same thing with Australia. There's a handful of nations, Canada, Oman, where, where the resources are so good that it is almost negligent to leave this policy off the table. Well, that is going to be our last word. We are out of time. Uh, it's a great last word to, to leave us with. Uh, I, but I want to thank the ISAF Secretariat for all their tremendous work organizing uh, this event and supporting this roadmap process. I want to thank my co-authors for the really extraordinary intellectual contributions on this topic uh, over, over many years. We have a number of questions which we haven't been able to get to. I'm sorry we haven't had time to do that. Um, please download the roadmap, and as you'll see, we're taking comments on the roadmap for the next three weeks. Uh, there's an email address in the roadmap. I'll say it now. It's um, uh, it's icefroadmap2021 at gmail.com. icefroadmap2021 at gmail.com. So so please write us there. Uh, and many many thanks. And I'll now I'll turn it back to our moderator.